What's up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay-per-view point edition of the Smart Out Moment Smack Talk podcast. I'm your host, as always, Tony Mango, and this is the WWE No Mercy 2017 Results Recap Post Show Podcast Review Reaction, etc., etc. I'm going to be talking about the results of, obviously, what happened during No Mercy 2017 and my pretty much immediate reactions to what went down here because it just ended about a half an hour ago. Finally got everything set up here, so it's time for me to kind of break down the positives, the negatives, and anything else we need to talk about here. And first things first, let's talk about the pre-show. The usual pre-show, we've got a situation where you could skip the entire thing and it wouldn't matter because nothing happened on the pre-show that you need to follow going forward. Uh, we had Alexa Bliss turn down a guy that said, will you marry me in the social media lounge? That was like the most fun part of like that outside entertainment type of thing. We had a couple of promos. We had video packages, the pre-show panel, you know, Tunga and Lawler and such. And I, I don't know, nothing was all that funny. Nothing was all that interesting. It was there for just eating up an hour. Uh, our match was Elias versus Apollo Crews, and Elias had his normal shtick. He did that little musical performance ahead of time, said that L.A. sucked. Kind of funny. And his match with Apollo Crews wasn't bad or anything like that, but this is the type of thing that if you have no setup, there's no feud, and both of these guys, they're not really doing too much right now at the moment. Apollo Crews, of course, is doing much less than Elias is, but... It's going to be generic, and it was fine. Like, there's nothing to complain about. You know, uh, two people go out there, they can put on a good match, and they put on a good enough match, but it was a pre-show match that had no stakes to it and nothing building up to it or anything like that. So if you missed it, you really didn't miss anything. It's not going to be on anybody's match of the year lists or anything like that. Uh, So, yeah, that full hour was basically a wash. You didn't really need to check it out. Usual affair with the pre-show. Not really too often do we get a situation where the pre-show is something that you really should be checking out. But hey, the last time that happened, that was, um, I think, Jericho and Owens in the social media lounge was like the last thing that I remember being like, man, you really should watch that. But, uh, you know, that is what it is. Um, or actually, uh, WrestleMania. Because the pre-shows for WrestleMania they at least have matches on there that are, like, decent matches. Uh, But speaking of pre-shows and putting on matches on there, the Intercontinental Championship was the first thing of the actual card, not the pre-show this time, The Miz and Jason Jordan, which was a decent match. I'm very glad that The Miz retained here. Uh, By the way, Elias beat uh, Apollo Crews, if you're just checking out the results of this. But Miz retained with the help of The Miz Taraj and... The, what was awkward about this was afterward, Jason Jordan came out, or, well, stayed out there to cut a promo, and it wasn't good. Uh, he hasn't been getting good reactions from the crowd, and this might be just a um, a personal uh, preference kind of a thing, but in my mind, look, if you don't like a wrestler, you can boo, you can cheer, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Whether you want, you're doing what WWE wants you to do or you're doing the opposite, do what you want. The whole point of WWE is that it's fake. And you can play whatever part you want to play in the role and you can switch it up and that's up to WWE to kind of go with the flow and stuff. But I think that people aren't giving Jason Jordan enough credit here. And they're crapping all over him. And I don't know why that's necessarily the case. I know that he's bland. I'll, I'll, I'll agree to that. Jason Jordan is bland. But he was pretty much getting booed from the start of this angle. And I don't know if that's because people don't like the angle or if they don't like Jason Jordan or both, or maybe it's a little bit of splashback of just that they don't like Jason Jordan more than the Miz. So the Miz is going to get cheered over him and stuff, but I think it's kind of ruining some of this. And if WWE doesn't pivot and change the story, it's not going to work out well. Jason Jordan going in as the baby face against the Miz has been something that hasn't worked multiple times now. So for him to cut a promo after the match where he's like, yeah, you know what? You suck, Miz. I want another match. That's not going to get the crowd to go, oh, shit, man, he's going to get another match. Uh, Jason Jordan, we're going to root for him this time. It's not going to work. That's not how this works. And the same thing I'm going to be talking about when it comes to Roman Reigns a little bit later on, but that's another uh, another whole thing to unravel. 
But it basically boils down to the Miz retains, and overall, I think that it's the smart move. Jason Jordan winning is something I could have been behind because there's the potential that maybe he does turn heel. Maybe he lets the Intercontinental title go to his mind and he gets a big ego about it and stuff like that. So there is a story to tell, but The Miz is the better performer right now and The Miz is the more interesting character. So if the Intercontinental title is on The Miz, it's going to get more attention. Plus, I think that The Miz could have a feud with Finn Balor And if the title's on Finn Balor, more people are going to care about it than if the title is on Jason Jordan. It's just a fact. I have my issues with Finn Balor, and we're going to get to that in a minute, but it's no comparison right now. Finn Balor is far more popular than Jason Jordan is. So if you want to transition the belt from The Miz over to somebody else, Roman Reigns, Finn Balor, uh, Braun Strowman, Samoa Joe you only have a list of a couple different people. And Jason Jordan is at the bottom of that list. He is still on the list, but he's at the bottom of it. You wouldn't go with uh, Apollo Crews over Jason Jordan. You wouldn't go for Kalisto over Jason Jordan. You wouldn't go for uh, Dean Ambrose because he's a a tag champ. You know, there's a certain method to the madness here. And The Miz retaining is the smarter move. Finn Balor, I mentioned a minute ago, I have my issues with him. And... This was another scenario where it was exactly what I expected it to be. Finn Balor versus Bray Wyatt was pretty bland. And they started the match off with Wyatt attacking Balor, and then it was kind of like, well, maybe he'll go to the back and he won't wrestle. Nah, it's too personal. He'll come out and wrestle anyway, and he wins the match, and I don't care. I just don't care. I was more concerned about why they have him wearing these different kinds of tights, because he looked like he was stealing something that Cody Rhodes had left behind, but I don't care about this feud and I'm done with it. And if they continue this for TLC, then I'm not going to care for the next five, six weeks or whatever long it takes to get to October 22nd. Anyway, it's a month away. So five weeks or whatever, but this feud has done like nothing for me. And I thought that that was going to be the case well before it even started. I remember writing something up or talking about it on a podcast or both of it or whatever, where I had mentioned the idea that Finn Balor versus Bray Wyatt is an entrance feud and nothing more, and they've been proving it. The feud, it's not bad. Let's put it this way. The matches aren't bad. They're just not good. And I feel like this was a bathroom break, especially for what followed up with it, because Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt had what what a lot of people would say would be like a an amazing match on an indie show, but a generic match on a Monday Night Raw. And I just, it's it. Like, I, I don't think that there's much to talk about with it. There's no big character change. No moves stood out to me. It just, it was a match. I'll pull a Drew. This was a match. But afterward, we get the bar against Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins for the Raw Tag Team Championship. And this match was awesome. Easily the best match of the night. And there was another match that was pretty damn good, too. So for this to just be an easily best match of the night to me, their last match at uh, SummerSlam was one of the best matches of the night. So I was looking forward to this. I figured they could be able to pull it off again, and goddamn, they did. One of the coolest parts of the whole scenario was Cesaro accidentally hitting his teeth on the uh, turnbuckle post. And I don't know if he knocked out the teeth or if he chipped them or what, but he's bleeding all over the place, and that became like one of the big focal points and stuff like that, but it helped sell the match too, because it ended up being a scenario where it was like, okay, he's bleeding now, and it's perpetual bleeding, and you can tell that that must hurt like a son of a bitch, and uh, it it helped the match out quite a bit. Uh, Ambrose was working a shoulder injury throughout that, and there was like, nah, we don't even care about this anymore, but that helped a little bit too. By the end of this, they just ended up having a really solid, fun, action-patched, and uh, action-patched, yeah, that's a fucking phrase, action-packed match, and I loved it. I thought it was awesome from start to finish, so big old thumbs up for this. I thought that that was fantastic, and this is a rare scenario where I hate usually when we see, like, three matches on three cards in a row, but I'm okay with this feud continuing for a TLC match. Or at the very least, 
having a fatal four-way TLC match where we get these two teams and the Good Brothers and the Hardy Boys. That could be cool. But just the idea of these two teams together, I'm okay for another one. And, of course, Ambrose and Rollins retain. But, uh, yeah, they, they've been killing it. Two out of two. So, uh, go for a hat trick. Why not? The Raw Women's Tag, uh, tag Team. Ah, uh, botching all over the place. I'm tired. Uh, the Raw Women's Championship Fatal 5-Way Match, which included Bailey, Sasha Banks, Emma, Nia Jax, and Alexa Bliss, came down to Alexa Bliss retaining in the end, which I think, again, smart move, the right move, because she is most likely going to drop that title to Asuka at TLC, and that's the way that I think that it should go. And the match was really good, actually. Uh, Bailey played her part with the Sasha Banks kind of angle, like, they were kind of interrupting each other quite a bit, so maybe there's a little bit of something in there. Emma really didn't do all that much, but she was another person. And uh, Nia Jax played her part great as being the monster that they everybody needed to gang up on, and Alexa Bliss played her part too, just being the champion who's a little scrappy and kind of uh, throwing herself into the mix to retain her title. And she hits that DDT on Bailey, gets the win, Another big thumbs up. No complaints on my end for this one. I thought it was booked exactly as it should go for the most part. Except maybe if I were were to nitpick about one little thing, maybe I would have had Sasha take the pin instead of Bailey. But, eh, it it, it didn't matter, you know? I don't think anybody's going to be like, oh my god, Bailey took the pin, so that means that she's worse off than Sasha. It's not going to make that big of a deal, but... Actually, you know what? Maybe Bailey taking the pin prevents us from doing Alexa versus Bailey at TLC. So maybe that's the better call. Anyway, maybe I should just retract my statement. Either way, that was like the most mild nitpick I could possibly do because I thought that this was pretty much essentially exactly what they should have done. John Cena versus Roman Reigns. This will be interesting. I I went into this match knowing. In my predictions, at the very least, Roman Reigns will win, and this is going to be the story of Roman Reigns. It's not a John Cena match. It's a Roman Reigns match. Now, if you're somebody who's a pro-John Cena guy or just an anti-Roman Reigns guy, you might be upset about it. But the problem with I, that I have with this match isn't that Roman Reigns won. It's that this match happened at no mercy for no reason other than to put Roman Reigns over. And no reason other than to put Roman Reigns over to offset his loss at SummerSlam so that they can build him up to that Brock Lesnar thing. I I just don't fucking like that. And I told you guys from the very start of this year that if this is all going to turn out to just be Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns, you're going to hear about it every fucking event. And I've been staying true to that because they have not ended that. So... I'm going to piggyback on this uh, a little bit, come back to this a little bit later on. So I'm going to skip and talk about this when I talk to about the main event. But another thing I kind of want to complain about a little bit is Neville versus Enzo Amore for the Cruiserweight Championship because this ended with Enzo winning the title. And in my mind, that's not the biggest like problem in the world or whatever, but it's also something that I think is problematic in a certain way. Neville dropping the title to Akira Tozawa just to win it back, just to lose it to Enzo, is the type of booking that I don't like, because it's hot potatoing a belt just for the sake of getting people to talk about it. And we've seen this happen with the Usos and the New Day, and we saw it with Sasha and Alexa, and we saw it multiple times this year with the United States Championship. That type of stuff pisses me off. Now, I know some people are going to go, but Tony... You're saying the hot potato stuff pisses you off, but you're mad about Brock Lesnar holding the title all this time. Yes, because I don't want Brock Lesnar holding the championship for all this time. In my mind, if Goldberg would have done his whole thing with Brock Lesnar, and I don't think that Goldberg should have won that title to begin with. I think that Kevin Owens should have kept that title and we should have had Kevin Owens versus Chris Jericho at WrestleMania for the United uh, for the Universal Championship. Brock Lesnar could have had his match with Goldberg, and you never would have heard any complaints about it from me. United States title would have been uh, uh, who had it at the time? Roman Reigns, I think, had it at the time. 
So he would have dropped it because if he's going to do his Undertaker match, it's not going to be for the United States title. And um, he would have dropped it to maybe Samoa Joe. And we could have gotten Samoa Joe versus like uh, Dean Ambrose or something like that. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but the scenario that bugs me with hot potatoing the title, uh, I feel like Enzo as a champion, is not going to fix anything for a 205 Live. Now, I did say a couple weeks ago, I think Enzo being on 205 Live is a good thing for Enzo and for 205 Live, and I stand by that. I still think that that's true, but I don't think that he should be the champion, especially not right now. Enzo isn't getting the same reaction from the crowd as he was getting a couple years ago, and now that he is starting to get these boos, why have him win the title in this kind of fashion? Uh... Not so much the fact that he won with a low blow. I mean, why have him win now? Why have him be the guy that beats Neville? If Neville wins the title back again, then they're just hot potatoing it again. If he doesn't, then where do they go in the future for this? And I'm hoping that where this goes is Enzo dropping the title to gentleman Jack Gallagher. Jack Gallagher, I think, is the type of guy that he could be the the champion and they never gave him a title reign. And at some point he's, he should win that belt. What annoys me a little bit about this though, is that that means that's a whole extra, another title reign before we would get who I was kind of hoping would be the next champion, which is Cedric Alexander. So on a personal preference note, I don't like Enzo winning because it means we're going to potentially, even if we go the way that I want it to go now, we would have to go at least, two or three months or so of gentleman Jack Gallagher eventually beating Enzo. Enzo retains these titles, uh, this title against Neville at TLC and at Survivor Series, for instance. Then Jack Gallagher wins and Gallagher holds the title all the way until like WrestleMania and Cedric wins it there. That means that Cedric doesn't get the title for another what, uh, nine months or seven months or however long it is. Mental math sucks. I don't feel like doing it. So that is a little bit annoying. But more so, it's the fact that this means that Enzo is definitely going to be the prime focal point of 205 Live. And I'm getting really sick and tired of Enzo. So I really was hoping that Neville would have just retained and we could have just gone straight to Cedric Alexander. And in the meantime, we could have gotten an Enzo and Jack Gallagher feud without the title on the line. Then Jack Gallagher would be the one that beats Cedric. That's kind of the scenario I was hoping. So not really a fan of uh, this scenario, but it is what it is. So let's get back to the Roman Reigns, John Cena, Brock Lesnar, Braun Strowman scenario. I had no faith whatsoever that Braun Strowman would win this match. And I know that some people did, and I commend you for your hope, but I knew that this wasn't going to happen because it's, this is what's been happening with Brock Lesnar. So you, Somebody gets built up to potentially beat him, and then they don't. It happened with Samoa Joe exactly the same way as it happened with Braun Strowman tonight. So I knew that this was going to be happening, and I had no faith and no hope that I was going to be happy at the end of the scenario, which this all boils down to John Cena potentially steps away for a while, and Roman Reigns gets the win over John Cena to offset SummerSlam, Brock Lesnar beats Braun Strowman to make him look even better and takes time off, I'm pretty sure. And uh, what do we get going forward? Braun Strowman now has to work his way back to the same spot that he's at without the ability to win the Universal title. So we ha- we know that there's nowhere to go from here. Nowhere. He's not going to win that title right now. He's not going to win the title until at least the day after WrestleMania. So... What do I have to look forward to necessarily? If he feuds with people like a Roman Reigns still, then it's not going to lead to anything. If he feuds with nobodies, then they're not utilizing the way that they should be utilizing him. Somebody like a Brock Lesnar, he'll probably take off until at least Survivor Series, maybe even longer. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we don't have a Raw pay-per-view in December is because they don't want to do that. So... I figure maybe he wrestles at Survivor Series and the Royal Rumble and at WrestleMania, and that's it. So he has three matches left. Let's take it that way. Four or five matches at most. 
because if you factor in Elimination Chamber slash Fastlane and the potential of them adding another December pay-per-view, then let's go with that. So five opponents at max is what he's got going for him. Roman Reigns is one of them. I'm assuming Finn Balor is another one. Probably Bray Wyatt is another one. And then there's two other ones that I don't think are going to be happening. Who knows? But maybe John Cena's one of them. Maybe, uh, who the fuck would be that other one? Maybe The Miz or something? I I don't know. I'm assuming it's only three. And I'm assuming it's Balor and Wyatt and uh, Roman Reigns. I don't want to see Brock, uh, Brock Lesnar versus Bray Wyatt. Who cares? Bray Wyatt's not going to win that fucking title. The match isn't going to be good. The feud's not going to be good. I don't care. I don't want to see Brock Lesnar versus Finn Balor. Finn Balor has no charisma. The feud is going to be basically uh, Paul Heyman cutting a promo about how good Finn Balor is, but how he's not going to beat Brock Lesnar, and then he's not going to beat Brock Lesnar. The end of it. It's a He outweighs him by 100 pounds, and it's just going to look silly. And then you build it all up and you spend two and a half months building up the idea of Roman Reigns, who he probably wins the Royal Rumble and that's why he challenges Brock Lesnar. So the Royal Rumble gets ruined. Nobody gives a shit about that anymore. And then Roman Reigns wins some kind of a match at Elimination Chamber or Fast Lane to make him look strong going into WrestleMania. Brock Lesnar either retains the title at that pay-per-view or doesn't wrestle there at all. And he loses at WrestleMania and that's the end of it. And then we go forward with that and this whole time they've had this idea that probably when Roman Reigns beats John Cena and they do that whole handshake and he puts him over, then people will start respecting him. It's not going to work. So come tomorrow night or yeah, well in a couple hours um, on Monday Night Raw, you're going to hear boos for Roman Reigns just the same, if not more than what you've been hearing going into the mercy. It's just the scenario that they're in. They built this for themselves and they can't get themselves out of it because they're not, booking a scenario to get themselves out of it. They're putting their fingers in their ears and they're going, if I don't hear it, it's not true. So what do I have to look forward to in the main event of Monday Night Raw going forward? Well, at TLC, we're going to get, what, Roman Reigns versus The Miz, maybe, and Braun Strowman versus whoever, and maybe Samoa Joe's ready in that time and they don't know what to do with him either. He should be on SmackDown. It's a whole big thing. There's nowhere for Braun to go. There's nowhere for Roman to go that's really all that interesting. If he wins the Intercontinental title, then people are just going to be uh, pissed that The Miz lost. And who does he lose it to? He loses it to Samoa Joe heading into WrestleMania? Sure, why not? But who cares? And Brock Lesnar wrestles a bunch of uh, people that I don't care about and obviously retains. I don't care about that either. So SmackDown's been problematic, but SmackDown at least has a little bit of intrigue of like, where do they go for the future here? Because I don't know what they're doing. I don't think that they know what they're doing either. But yeah, WWE's in a weird spot right now. Now the pay-per-view itself, no mercy. This was a good pay-per-view overall. Uh, The John Cena Roman Reigns match was good. The Fatal 5-Way match was good. The Raw Tag Team Championship match was good. Ms. Jordan was fine. Uh, Balor Wyatt, it was just it was just a generic match, so there's nothing to really complain about, other than how it was just blah. Elias Cruz, same type of thing. Uh, I, I dislike the way that they ended the Neville match. I think that he should have retained, and I dislike that Braun Strowman lost, but I kind of figured that those things were potentials, and they just kind of annoy me about what the future is going to be, not so much about what happened here exactly. So this was a better event, I think, than SummerSlam, but it still means that we've got a problematic future that we're building towards, which makes me uh, nervous about future events because do I really want to see TLC if what I have to look forward to is Asuka destroying Alexa Bliss and no Brock and who knows what they do with some of the other things? If it ends up being a scenario where all I have to look forward to at TLC is the Raw tag title match, that's not good enough. So we'll see because TLC is coming up on October 22nd. I said that weird October, uh, October 22nd. So we got a couple of weeks before we do that. Before that though, we were going to be having our SmackDown event, which is hell in a cell on October 8th. 
So the next pay-per-view point that you guys will be hearing the predictions and the review for will be that one. But next week is going to be the mailbag for September. So send in your questions as soon as you get a chance to, and I will set that all up. Probably be doing that on like Friday or so. So you have about a week uh, to take care of that. But the sooner you send the questions in, the better. And um, make sure that you hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that already for the account because then you'll be notified if you ring that little bell and check off notifications of when we post our next videos and stuff, which will probably be the hot tags and then the mailbag. And we'll see if anything else pops up. But uh, follow us on the YouTube channel there. If you're listening on iTunes and Stitcher, you should be definitely following us on Facebook and Twitter at Smartout Moment to get notifications of these things that are going to be popping up. And obviously, SmartoutMoment.com for all the other kind of content that's out on the website. Make sure that you check out Fanboys Anonymous as well for whenever I post some things on there. Follow me at Tony Mango all over the place. And of course, don't forget to leave your comments below and tell me what you thought of No Mercy and what you'd like to see going forward in the future for WWE. But that's it for me for this edition of the Pay-Per-View Point and Smack Talk and all the other kind of jargon like that. So, adios everybody. Thanks for listening. This has been another Smart Out moment, and I'm being counted out. 